Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of the George Washington University, Dr. Stephen Knapp. Good evening. Good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, students, faculty, and staff of the George Washington University, I'm really delighted to welcome you to this special presentation on his book by Aspen Institute President and CEO Walter Isaacson. And by his book, I mean his latest book, and I'll talk about his other writings in just a moment. It's truly an honor to host the inaugural meeting of the Aspen Undergraduate Business Education Consortium and to welcome Mr. Isaacson back to our foggy bottom campus. We were just talking about the fact that when he used to run CNN, uh, this was the studio that was designed for the program Crossfire. So this is a really a historic uh, connection. Walter Isaacson is chairman of the board of Teach for America, which recruits recent college graduates to teach in underserved communities, and which incidentally has been the largest employer of newly graduated George Washington students in each of the last four years. From 2010 to 2012, Mr. Isaacson served by presidential appointment and Senate confirmation as chairman of the Broadcasting Board of Governors, which oversees Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, as well as other international broadcast programs in the United States. He's currently vice chair of Partners for a New Beginning, a public-private group working to forge ties between the United States and the Muslim world. He serves on the boards of United Airlines and Tulane University, and on the Honorable and Reverend Board of Overseers of Harvard University. I like to give you the full formal title because you don't always hear that. <laughs> um, to mention one more instance of this remarkable record of service, Following Hurricane Katrina, he served from 2005 to 2007 as vice chair of the Louisiana Recovery Authority. Before joining the Aspen Institute, Mr. Isaacson had a distinguished career in journalism. He has held positions with the Sunday Times of London, Time, where he became the magazine's 14th editor, and again, CNN, where he served as chairman and CEO. Walter Isaacson is also a prolific and best-selling writer. He's the author of Einstein, his life and universe, and Benjamin Franklin and American Life, both New York Times bestsellers. He's also the author of the critically acclaimed Kissinger, a biography, and co-author of The Wise Men, Six Friends, and The World They Made. Mr. Eisen graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in History and Literature before Harvard College, uh, from Harvard College, and received a Master of Arts in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics from Pembroke College of the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He joins us this evening to discuss his latest book, Steve Jobs, which is currently not only on, but number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Walter Isaacson. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank the uh, honorable and reverend Mr. President. I like that phrase a lot. Uh, it's like when they asked Henry Kissinger when he became Secretary of State, should we call you Dr. Kissinger, uh, Dr. Secretary or Mr. Secretary? And he said, your honor will do, you know, or your excellency will do. Uh, it's great to be here, especially to combine the passions that Steve Jobs combined, which was for the liberal arts and the notion of business and technology. That's what Judy Samuelson and the rest of the Aspen Institute uh, Business and Society program is doing here. That's exactly what a great institution like George Washington University does. And in some ways, it was the secret sauce in my mind, and it's the theme of the book I wrote uh, about Steve Jobs and what made him great. Uh, Steve Jobs called me uh, in the summer of 2004, right after I got to the Aspen Institute, uh, and I said, why don't you come speak at the Institute? He said, no, I don't want to speak at the Institute, but I want to come by and take a walk with you. I didn't realize that was his way of uh, sort of holding a business meeting. And uh, he asked me then, because I had just finished Benjamin Franklin and was about to finish uh, Albert Einstein, my biography of Einstein, he said, why don't you do me next? And I must admit, I'm thinking, okay, uh, Franklin, Albert Einstein, you. Arrogant little prick. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize uh, then, you know, that he was, uh, had just been diagnosed with cancer. He was keeping it secret. His wife later told me he called you right after the diagnosis. Uh, he had a great sense of history, and I think he realized that if he was going to fight this disease, he wanted to understand, you know, he wanted people to help understand 
uh, his role in history and what Apple had done in history. Also, uh, by the time I decided, whoa, this is going to be an interesting book, he had truly transformed six industries, uh, transformed the personal computer industry by basically inventing it. He and Waz invent the computer that starts the personal computer industry. But then it goes all the way through from uh, music and how we consume music, even the music uh, business model, to uh, desktop publishing, to the phone industry, to publishing with the iPad, tablet computing, even digital animation and retail stores uh, all get transformed by Steve. And you ask him why, over and over again, he'll say, because when I was a young kid, I looked up to a guy named Edwin Land, who had in, created Polaroid. And Edwin Land said, the place to stand always is at the intersection of the arts and the sciences, at the intersection of the liberal arts and sort of the technology business world. And he said, that's where I've always tried to stand. That's what set us apart from Microsoft, other computer makers and software makers, is that we had the humanities in our genetic code. And uh, for those of you who are the students here, you don't realize that this is the theme of the conference that has been brought together, which is how in the world of business do we make sure that the humanities stay in our genetic code. His life was the creation myth of Silicon Valley entrepreneurship and business writ large, starting a business in his parents' garage, then getting kicked out of the business, then having to be brought back because the business needed him, and then creating what is by far the most valuable company on earth. And in looking for the real lessons of Steve Jobs, some people, not people in business schools and not people who have actually been entrepreneurs, some people read the book and say, wow, he was pretty tough as a character. He's kind of a jerk. And I say, no, 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 you're, kind of, you're missing the point. Uh, there's a whole lot of jerks in this world. In fact, we all know a lot of them. Uh, what set Steve apart was that he was able to tie the passion and the emotionalism that you saw in his personal life with a desire for making great products. This book is sold particularly well in China, and uh, I was amused by the lesson somebody said that they were learning there. He said, somebody said that I was helping the US economy because I was teaching a whole new generation of Chinese students that the way to succeed was to quit college, drop a lot of acid, and defy authority. <laughs> And I said, no. So I've written a piece that will actually come out tomorrow, which is on the cover of the Harvard Business Review, which is this notion of tying together the humanities, business, and technology to find the real lessons of Steve Jobs. The first of those lessons to me is have a passion for your product. There is a subtle difference, he said, but it means everything in the world between people who have a passion for making a profit and people who have a passion for making a product. And he said that when he left Apple, that's what almost destroyed it, was John Scully and others came in and said, how can we maximize profits instead of making the best possible product? That requires taking a passionate pride in the perfectionism you can create in a product and just trusting that the profits and the revenues will follow. When he was very young, seven years old, uh, his father, his adoptive father, was uh, building a fence around the backyard of the house and had Steve help him. And his father said to him, we have to make the back of this fence just as good looking, you know, just as great, just as beautiful as the front of the fence. And Steve said, why? Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever know. And his father said, but you will know. And f Steve said that was the first lesson he got about how you make sure you have a passion for making a product as good as possible. So when he first uh, starts making the Macintosh, he sits there with those graphical user interface icons, looking at every pixel and seeing how they fit together. He had uh, dropped out of college. This is always the bad part when I'm talking at colleges, uh, you know, the notion of dropping out. But he had stayed around to take the humanities courses and engineering courses he needed just by auditing them and reading. And the one that he said was so important to him was calligraphy because it showed the beauty of every little thing we do, the beauty of font, a sans serif font, a, you know, a, you know, the 
you know, different ways of designing files. So when he did the Macintosh, it's a bitmap screen, meaning every pixel is bitmap to a part of the uh, microprocessor. So he could make fonts that beautiful. That's how he ends up creating the desktop publishing industry. And so he's looking at every one of these fonts. He's looking at the design of the machine and trying to get it absolutely perfect. He also, at one point, just before they're shipping the product, he looks at the circuit board. And he tells the engineers and the small renegade group that he has doing the Macintosh, this circuit board sucks. It's ugly. The chips, and they said, what do you mean? They said, the chips, they're not lined up straight. And the engineer says, well, that's not how you make a circuit board. Besides, you have such a passion for this product, you've insisted that it be like an appliance. You can't open it up, unlike Wozniak's Apple II, that you could open up, had slots in it. The Macintosh didn't even have screws that a consumer could open. It was totally sealed. Steve had brought a cuisine art back from the local Macy's to show how he wanted it to look and feel and be sealed like an appliance. So the engineers say to him, why does it matter? Nobody will ever see the circuit board. Nobody will ever know. And Steve said the same thing that his father had said to him, but you will know. And so they hold up shipping the Mac until they redo the circuit board so it looks beautiful, even though it's inside the sealed case that nobody will be ever able to open. And once he had done that, he told all the 32 engineers, sign your name. And they all did with Stephen P. Jobs in lowercase in the center. And he said, and he engraved it on the inside of the case, where nobody would ever see it, but he said, real artists sign their work. That's how you know you have pride in what you do. So he wanted that end-to-end -end control, that perfect thing where he had a, like an artist would create, that nobody else could fiddle with, but it was that passion for perfection that drove people nuts, but it also drove them to do things that they never dreamed were possible. And that was the second lesson of Jobs, which is driving people not just to distraction, but to do what they thought was impossible. His colleagues called it the reality distortion field. There's a way, it was from a, those of you who are Trekkies know what it's from, a great Star Trek episode where the reality distortion field comes in. But he would convince people and just stare at them and tell them they could do things until they would do things that they felt just were, you know, feats of impossibility. It starts in Atari where he and Waz are both dropouts uh, and working the night shift. And they uh, have to do a game called Breakout. And Steve says, Steve Jobs says, you have to do it in four days because obviously Waz was the engineer doing the coding. And well, I said, why? He said, well, we have to get back. They, he worked on an apple farm, hence the name of the company they eventually do, an apple commune. And Waz well, said, well, you can't do this coding in four days. It'll take me at least a month. And Jobs stared at him, unblinking, as he had trained himself to do, and said, don't be afraid. You can do it. And Waz says, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know how to code even, hardly. Was, and Jobs said, don't be afraid. You can do it. Waz said it was the most amazing thing. He stayed up four days straight and finished the breakout game in just four days. And he said, that was the key to Steve. I was always nicer to people, but Steve was able to drive people into doing these uh, huge things. For example, when they were doing the Macintosh a few years later, uh, it took a while to boot up. It took 70 seconds to boot up. It was almost as bad as a uh, Windows machine, you know, and <laughs> being slow to boot up. So Jobs says to uh, Larry Kenyon, who's the engineer, You've got to shave 10 seconds off the boot up time. And Kenyon says, look at the code. It's perfectly elegant. There's no way you can shave 10 seconds off this. And Steve said, if you could save a human life, would you be able to shave 10 seconds off? And Kenyon kind of goes, well, I guess so. So Steve says, OK. And he goes to a whiteboard. And he says, a million Macintoshes will be sold next year. They'll be booted up at least twice a week. So over the course of the year, you can save the equivalent of 90 lives if you shave those 10 seconds off. Kenyon said he went back to his cubicle, and two weeks later, he had shaved 28 seconds off the boot-up time of the original Mac. And one of my favorites involves uh, Corning Glass, because not too long ago, uh, when Steve Jobs was first doing the iPhone, he decided if it was going to be an insanely beautiful product, it couldn't have plastic on the front. It had to have a really nice, tempered, silky, smooth, indestructible form of glass. 
So he sent to the suppliers in China who have made all the glass for all the great Apple stores, including the one a few blocks away on Wisconsin Avenue, and you see those huge panes of glass that they had to build special autoclaves for in China. And the people in China said, no, no, we can't make a glass that tough, that you know, hard, that smooth and silky the way you want it. And finally, somebody suggested to Jobs that maybe I ought to check with Corning Glass in the United States. So he called up Wendell Weeks, a great guy who's the CEO of Corning, and, uh, and actually just called the switchboard at Corning, said, I want to speak to Wendell Weeks. Of course, the switchboard said, fine, leave your name and you know, number, and we'll get back to you. And Steve said, no, it's Steve Jobs. I want to speak to him right now. And they said, no, leave your name. And so Steve slams down the phone, and says, typical East Coast bullshit, he tells people. That, <laughs> It gets back to Wendell Weeks, the CEO, what had happened. So Wendell Weeks, a smart guy, picks up the phone, calls the Apple switchboard, and says, let me speak to Steve Jobs. <laughs> they say, put your request in writing and fax it to us. <laughs> Wendell Weeks hangs up. It gets back to Steve. Steve says, you're my type of guy, and meets with him, goes to meet him. Describes the type of glass he needs. Wendell Weeks says, you know, many years ago, in the days of Ralph Nader, we developed a very... Uh, new type of process that you could do to temper the glass and make something like this. But we never manufactured it because we didn't need to. And he started to describe it, and Jobs said, no, no, it wouldn't work. And Wendell says, hey, wait a minute. I know how to make glass. You don't. Shut up. Listen. And Jobs, who is very good at being pushed back upon, another lesson, a guy who drives people like crazy but loves it when people push back and are tough to him. So Wendell Weeks gets tough on him, and Jobs says, OK, you're right. I need this amount of glass. By September, the phone's coming out in October. And Weeks says, uh, you didn't actually listen to me. We actually don't make this glass. We don't have a factory that can do it. He says, well, start. And Wendell Weeks says, no. And we, we, there's just no. And Steve Jobs, 30 years after he had done it to Waz, does the same thing, stares at him, unblinking, and says, don't be afraid. You can do it. Wendell Weeks says, this guy's, I actually flew up to Corning because I had sort of heard this. They kept it secret. I mean, it's, I, until the book came out, nobody knew Corning made this glass because it's typical Apple secrecy. But I'd heard this story, and I actually wanted to go to the place where they make it. So I'm sitting there, and Wendell Weeks is like pointing the chair. And, say, and Steve Jobs keeps saying to him, don't be afraid. You can do it. I know you can do it. And after Jobs leaves, Weeks picks up the phone and calls the factory near Lexington, Kentucky, tiny village in Kentucky, where they're making flat screen TV glass, and says, tomorrow I want you to start making Gorilla Glass, according to the formula. They said, well, we don't have the material. We can't, you know, we've never done it before. We can't really do it. And Wendell Weeks says, don't be afraid. You can do it. <laughs> and within nine months, they had produced all the glass Apple needed. And that's why every iPhone and every iPad you ever have all has glass made in Kentucky by Corning because of Steve Jobs' reality distortion field. The other thing that Steve was able to do, one of the great lessons, was the virtue of simplicity. I think it came from his Zen Buddhist training. He went to India as a kid and hitchhiked around for about nine months, studied uh, Buddhism, particularly like the Zen gardens of uh, Japan. And he began to understand something about simplicity, which is it's not just removing clutter. It's not just taking things away. It's understanding the core of a product, the real essence of a product, and making sure everything defers to it so that you get, as he put it on top, the first Apple marketing brochure, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. I like to think that he and Waz first uh, appreciated simplicity when they were working at Atari. Uh, Waz told me the story when they're doing games uh, they had to really simplify them because games like Pong and Breakout and uh, Star Trek had to be the type of games that a stone freshman could figure out, you know, without a manual late at night. So if you look at, like, the Star Trek game, all it says is insert quarter, avoid Klingons. You know, it's just <laughs> that simple. But there was, you know, throughout his life, Steve is always trying to find the ultimate simplicity. At one point, they, were cre they had created the program called iDVD, some of you may know, uh, that allows you to burn a, you know, a DVD on your uh, laptop or Mac. And somebody had come up with the interface, and it looked like a typical, you know, crappy Microsoft Word product with ribbons and all sorts of junk and menu. And Steve looked at it and said, this is bullshit. He said, Here's what the interface looks like. And he just drew 
a blank box. And at the bottom, you do a little flame. He said, that's it. You want to burn something? You drag it into the box, you hit the button that says burn. Nothing else. Keep it simple. And indeed they did. When they were doing the iPod, Steve insisted that he could get to any song in just three clicks. He said, and they said, well, you need a screen to do artist and album and song. No, you don't. People don't care whether it's artist. They just want to get to the song they want. Let them get there. Over and over again, he would think out of the box, think imaginatively, to simplify the interface. He said, you have to know the depth of every complexity in order to simplify it. And eventually at the end, they get, which some of you are old enough to remember, that first iPod, that beautiful white, almost like a deck of cards with the track wheel in the middle. No instructions, no, you know, fast forward, double, fa you know, just a track wheel, and you could figure it out. No manual, even. But Steve looked at it and said, what's this? Pointing to the button on top. And they were kind of hesitant because they knew he knew what it was. It was the on-off switch. So somebody finally says, it's on-off switch. And he says, well, why the hell is it here? And they paused and they said, well, to turn it on and off. <laughs> he says, why do we need that? And it took them a moment, but they realized, you don't need an on-off switch. When people quit using an iPod, it gently powers down. When you start using it again, it gently powers up. You don't need that. And so everything about him was ability to think a little differently, as he put, in order to combine design, simplicity, beauty with business and engineering. He also had a great uh, focus. When he came back to Apple, for example, they were milking profits, like I said, as opposed to caring about the beauty of each product. So by that point, they had more than 40 Macintoshes they were selling, the 2800C and the 2800X and 3800 and the 4800, and they were for different markets. And you know it was being driven by the sales force and the marketing people as opposed to the product and engineering and design people. And Steve kept saying, why do we have this? Why are we making printers and peripherals and whatever? And finally, he said, stop. And he went to the whiteboard and just drew a grid of four squares. He put home, office, laptop, desktop. He said, that's it. We're going to make four computers. Just focus on that. And that's what they did. They made four computers, you know, the PowerBook, the, the new iMac, one for each of those quadrants instead of trying to milk the profits that you can do by having multiple lines of different type of products. Once they succeeded, and Apple had been saved from being 90 days away from bankruptcy, he would take his top people on a retreat for two and a half days, and they would talk about what great new products they wanted to do next. And uh, the first uh, time they went on the street, there were dozens and dozens, maybe scores of ideas, and everybody's fighting to get on Steve's whiteboard where he's controlling it. And finally, at the end, he has the whiteboard, and people have fought to get on that page to be in the 10 that made it on the whiteboard. And then, when it was all resolved, he took his marker, and crossed out the bottom seven and says, we can only focus on three. We have to focus, which is why you have iPod, iPhone, iPad. That ability to focus and to simplify problems, he said, came from the intuitive feel of standing at the intersection of art and business, of great design and great technology. And he also said that it was the intuitive feel, the intuition. He said, when I went to India, I learned the limits of Western rational thought. And I realized the value of intuition, of having experiential knowledge that comes from just sensing the aesthetic and the beauty and the poetry of things. And from that intuition, knowing what will make people emotionally happy. When they had their first uh, discussion of the original Mac, one of the engineers back in the early 1980s said, well, should we do some market research, a focus group, to sh see what people might want in the computer? And Steve said, how do people know what they want in this new computer until we've shown them what they want? His, his view was always that of Henry Ford, which is, if I did a lot of market research and asked my customers what they wanted, I would have found out they wanted a faster horse instead of a whole new type of product. So Steve always was using that, and he said that's what separated him from the person who's sort of his binary star twin in the digital age, 
Bill Gates. I think even he would admit that Bill Gates is in a conventional sense, was in a conventional sense, much smarter than Steve Jobs. If you ever watch Bill Gates, he could look at two computer screens, different sort of windows on each screen, processing huge amount of information and getting to very sharp, data-driven, empirical, analytic judgments. But he didn't have, and never did, the fingertip feel for the beauty, the poetry, as Steve said. Steve said, the reason he made the Zune and we made the iPod, most of you don't remember what the Zune was, for real good reason, with a Microsoft music player that looked like it had been designed in Uzbekistan or someplace, <laughs> is because at Microsoft, they don't have the humanities in their DNA. They just don't really care about beauty and art and music. And that's why Apple will always be set apart. For a while, it hurt Apple. Because in the 1980s, Steve was such a perfectionist about connecting art and design and technology and business that he wanted end-to-end -end control of everything. You couldn't buy a Macintosh machine without using the Macintosh operating system or vice versa. Whereas Windows, you know, they licensed it out promiscuously so that Microsoft Windows could be used on an HP, a Dell, an IBM, or whatever. So the two different models that are still the great competing models in the digital age are open versus closed. The integrated model of Apple, where if you're going to get the iPod, you have to have iTunes, and you're going to go to the iTunes store, and you work on a Mac with a Mac OS, et cetera. Or the more open model, which was Microsoft in the 80s, and now Android and Google uh, doing a more open model these days. That drove Steve to distraction, not, as he put it when he was ranting to me, and it's been quoted pretty often now that the lawsuits are about to happen, not because he felt Google just ripped him off and he wanted the money, but because they lacked that taste to really care about end to end. And that's the way he felt about Bill Gates. However, when he did come back to, Microsoft, I mean, to Apple in 1997, even though they were suing each other and even though there had been a bad falling out, uh, Steve's first phone call really is to Bill. And he says, you got to start making great software for the Mac again. I'm back. I want to bring it back, and I need Microsoft software. And Bill Gates is a very gracious guy. And so uh, he said, sure. And he came down, famous Macworld Boston 1997. Bill Gates appears and talks about, we're going to start working with Apple again. Second call Steve made was to Adobe. His friends John Warnock and others who had started Adobe, who... Uh, you know, Apple had helped them get off the ground. He said, you got to start making Adobe software for the Mac again. And they said, no, you have too small of a market share. And that is why, to this day, you will never get Flash on your iPod or iPhone. <laughs> Not because it's a battery hog or a spaghetti ball piece of technology, necessarily, but because Steve never forgave them, and even though Steve is gone, uh, Apple will not forgive uh, Adobe for doing that. Uh, and the final sort of combination of all of this is the sort of last piece of advice he gave when he gave a commencement speech. And that was, stay hungry, stay foolish. Those of you who remember the great Whole Earth Catalog, I grew up in the era of the Whole Earth Catalog, Stuart Brand's Catalog, which combined sort of the counterculture uh, aesthetic with that of technology and tools for living. Uh, the very last Whole Earth Catalog in the very back on the back cover, just a person, young guy, walking down a country road all alone. And the headline is, stay hungry, stay foolish. Steve said, that's what I learned from having the humanities ingrained in me, which is, you always have to think out of the box, get out of your groove. He was old enough to remember what a groove is. It's something on vinyl records, for those of you who don't remember them. Uh, he always felt that if you really were driven not only by profits, but by poetry, you'd be willing to try things different, to think different, to think out of the box. Uh, near the end of his life, we were sitting on his bed, and he was uh, reciting from memory the uh, 1997 Think Different ad. That was sort of his mantra. And here's to the crazy one, the rebels, the misfits, those who, and it ends by saying, and those who are crazy enough to think they can uh, change the world are the ones who do. And by the end, Steve was crying. I mean, he was a very emotional guy. And he said, I've always believed deeply in that, which is why I've always told people to stay hungry, stay foolish. Near the very end of his life, last 
August, I think it was, Bill Gates wanted to come visit. So I said, Bill Gates is a very, very uh, decent guy, caring guy. And uh, so he called up, and Steve, who is not always so gracious, said something like, uh, what a jerk. I actually used a word that begins with A, but I see a camera, so, so I won't do it. He just thinks I'm dying, and he wants to make it up to me. But eventually, Bill Gates came to the house in Palo Alto, knocked on the back door. Steve's youngest daughter is there in the kitchen, opens it up, and points to the back where her father is. And they talked for about three hours about being, you know, these icons of the digital age. And at one point, Bill Gates says to Steve, I never thought the end-to-end -end model in which you have such, you know, feel for the art of it, that the integrated model would work, but you proved it could work. And Steve, being somewhat gracious, sort of mumbled, well, you proved your model could work as well. Being a biographer, because I was there in Palo Alto at the time, doing, you know, talking to both of them after the meeting, I thought, man, this is a great, beautiful ending to the book. You know, you feel the violins, you almost see the movie scene. <laughs> uh, so afterwards, I say to Gates, you know, that's great. And he says, yeah, what I didn't tell Steve is that the end-to-end -end model works, but it really only works well when you have an artist like Steve Jobs who cares so much with a passion for the product that he'll make that end-to-end -end model work. I thought, wow, that's nice. So next evening I saw Jobs, I was at the house. I told him what Bill said. And I thought this will add to the great ending of the book. So Steve looks up and I said, you know, he said it only works with a great artist like you uh, to do it. And Steve, of course, looks up and says, what an asshole. Uh, <laughs> He says, uh, Bill could have made it work, but he didn't. Why? Because he has no taste. He doesn't have that humanities in his genes. He doesn't stand at the intersection of the humanities and business and technology. I said, but you said his model worked just as well. He said, yeah, I said that. His model works fine, but only if you don't care about making crappy products. That's all Microsoft ever did. <laughs> So I said, well, there goes the great ending of the book. But uh, <laughs> the ending of the book I ended up using, though, is I then went later into the garden with Steve. And he was a very spiritual person, especially after his Zen Buddhist training. And I said to him, are you still spiritual? Do you believe in God? And he said, well, I don't know. It's sometimes I feel like it's 50-50. He said, you know, I like to believe, and especially now that I'm sick, I very much like to believe that there's something more to this world than you see. That that's why we aspire for beauty, the humanities. That's what infuses it into us. And that all that experiential wisdom we have somehow lives on. It's part of history. You've added it back to the flow of history. He says, but then sometimes I worry that maybe it's just like an on-off switch. You die and <laughs> click, you're gone. That's sort of stayed silent. I was, and then he gave me sort of that half smile and he said, I guess that's why I never like putting on off switches on Apple devices. <laughs> anyway, thank you all very much and we have a 20, 30 minutes for questions. Appreciate it. I'm happy to uh, questions, please. Shout them out and I can repeat them or Raise your hand. Oh, there's a microphone. Cool. Yeah. We're all set up here at GW. All set up. Well, I've got those lights that I paid a lot for when I was running CNN. That <laughs> if you don't get the lighting right, Carville looks really bad. So <laughs> we have to have so many be, spotlights. This will be our own version of Crossfire. You know, uh, um, so I, I'm a first year MBA student here at GW, and uh, I read your book over Christmas. And I guess first a comment. You know, we spent a lot of time in class talking about leadership and, and management, I thought, you know, your book offered uh, amazing insight into the fragility of being a visionary, uh, a leader, and then also a manager, uh, and how he was exceptional at some things and pretty atrocious at others. So that, yep. that's the comment. I guess my, my question to you is today, Apple announced the dividend, and what would Steve, what, what does Steve think about that? Yeah, I'll actually comment on your comment first. Because fortunately, you're in business school, and as I said, I wrote this thing for the Harvard Business Review because I was somewhat annoyed at people who don't understand business saying, oh, he was kind of a jerk. I guess that's the way you should be. That's, you should be a great leader to be a jerk or something. I said, no, no, you're missing the point. As I said at the beginning, the world is filled with jerks, but they aren't filled with people 
who can get people to make Gorilla Glass when they don't think they can, or march through walls, be inspiring and stuff. So I think the lessons of leadership is that fragile line between being very inspiring and charismatic or turning people off. And Steve turned off about 20% of the people, but he developed an incredible loyal cadre of people. Steve, being a somewhat of a controlling guy in everything he did, really liked to keep cash. Um, it was insane. I mean, you know better than I because you're in business school and I haven't been to business school. But the amount of cash that they hoarded did not make any sense, whether return on investment or your security as a company. He would say to me when I'd ask him, well, maybe something will come along. But Apple doesn't go around buying things, you know, the way other companies do. And I think it was just a desire to have total control of your destiny. He had, I think, more, or Apple had more cash on hand than the U.S. government. Is that right? I read that at one point. I mean, late last year, I think. Um, obviously, uh, Steve would not have liked the decision because for many, many years he refused to make that decision, which is do a stock buyback and dividends. Uh, but he was really smart in picking Tim Cook. As I said, he tended to promote people who stood up to him as opposed to people who got pushed around by him. And he really trusted Tim Cook. And Tim Cook has taken over this con company, along with Johnny Ives, Scott Forrestal, Phil Schiller, Eddie Q, a really great team, and they don't spend their mornings sitting around a table saying, what would Steve do? They did what Steve wanted them to do, which is they decided to run the company the best they could. At the very last Apple board meeting, I mean, the last one for Steve, when he submitted his resignation as CEO, it was a pretty moving time, and Tim is running it, and Steve dominates Tim to be the new CEO. And... Um, then there's somebody starts making a joke, some of the board members, about HP, how Hewlett Packard had gotten out of the tablet business that day and screwed up its PC business. And he said, Steve looked at the you know, boardroom and said, stop it. Quit gloating. Bill Hewlett gave me my first job and, uh, when I was 13 years old in the summer. And he and David Packard thought they had made a company that would last. And he... They imbued it with certain values of making good products, just like Walt Disney did, of being at the intersection of the imagination and technology with the Walt Disney Company. And he said, and these bozos running HP are now screwing it up. Don't let that happen to Apple. He said, it's easy to make, it's not easy, he said, it may be tough to make good products, but what's really hard is to make a company that will continue year after year to make good products. And so I think he felt that he needed a team running Apple that could think on its own, take its own direction, and uh, even though he was a tough boss, it was hard to like, go in a different direction than Steve unless you could convince him otherwise. Uh, I think he'd be proud that Tim Cook said, I'm not, doing a, I'm not waking up this morning and say, what would Steve do? I'm doing this dividend and this buyback. Yes, sir. Um, thanks for coming and speaking with us. I'm a freshman in the School of Business here, and my question for you is, as I was reading the book a few months ago, I was really struck by how in some instances uh, Mr. Jobs could be rude or arrogant, if, at least to my perspective reading, and I was wondering if you could comment on that given your sort of unique relationship with him and specifically maybe on his views on philanthropy because I know that right. it was sort of expressed that he wasn't interested in that. Right. Well, uh, he was rude and unkind at times. And people sometimes ask me, as, you know, almost like the first question, is that sort of the lesson of this book? This book, I hate to say it in this room, is not a how-to book for business. It's not a manual on how to be a great leader. Uh, there are many, many books. There's about 50 per week published on how to be an effective leader. This is a biography of a dude who happened to be in front of me for you know, three or four years, and I had to write his story. It's up to you and people who write management books to extract the lessons. But the debate, which I find interesting and good, is do you have to be that rude and that unkind to people? Uh, I sort of answer it a bit in the end, and I have other people answering it. But I don't try to s preach. I don't try to say, here's the no asshole rule or whatever the books are called. 
I say, here's Steve Jobs, you extract the lessons from it. So it was difficult. What I came to realize, though, was Steve Jobs was very tough. He could truly just say very cutting things. And I said, why? He said, because I'm brutally honest, and I want you to be brutally honest in this book. He said, too many people are velvet gloved. They have sort of an East Coast way of speaking, you know, and instead of saying, this sucks. And if you want to prevent a bozo explosion in a company, you got to be brutally honest. And uh, maybe I could have been kinder, but that's just not who I was. I found it tough, but I also tried to judge him by the results, which is not just the results are the iPod is pretty darn good looking and the iPod Nano is just astonishing. It's he put together the most loyal, tightest team of top managers at Apple that have been with him 10, 15 years. I mean, a few people like Avi Tavani and Leave and uh, Tony Fidel, but generally, if you're looking at Schiller, Eddie Q, Ive, even Tim Cook, whatever, they've been there for a very long time. They could have gotten jobs anywhere. So if he was truly mean to them, they would have left. But it was more than just being tough. It was being inspiring and compelling. Likewise, you know, he even said, I wasn't the greatest family man. But I have people saying, oh, he wasn't a great family man. I'm looking at them, and they're like on their third marriage. They can't remember the birthdays of children by their second marriage. Steve had a really loyal, loving wife. He had four loving kids. They were all with him at the end, a great sister. So he did inspire people to be with him. In terms of philanthropy, no, he was not. He, 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 I said he liked to focus. That was out of his range of focus. His wife is a great philanthropist, not only giving money, but starting things like college track. You know, she's done great things that way. I think it would have been greater had he cared more about Chinese workers, had he been more of a philanthropist. But once again, I was writing a biography, and I was writing about, about a guy who really existed and was flesh and blood. Yeah. Hi, thank you for coming over to DJW. Uh, I'm a first year MBA student as well. Uh, I have a small question about uh, Steve's uh, idea of creating a legacy in Apple and probably uh, having his DNA imbibe in a lot of leaders for future. Uh, I understand that he brought in Joel Padalny uh, to start something like Apple University. It's, it's a kind of uh, not really talked about in media open, in open, but can you just shed some light on his views and what was his insights on creating that DNA and that culture in Apple after his demise? Um, he felt very strongly about it, and he could rattle off people who did it right, i.e. Walt Disney, Edison, I mean, companies that survive because they have a certain DNA to them. And by the way, people like Walt Disney, Ford, Edison, they were no uh, kind saints and Mother Teresas as they walked down the street either. But people remember them because of the DNA they imbued into the company. How do you do it? He said it's done every little thing from who you promote to, how, you know, to how, when you let a product out. Almost every product he created, for example, like I said about the Macintosh and the circuit board, near the end, right when it's about to be launched, he stops. He hits the pause button. And he says, this isn't good enough. Even the Apple stores, they're right about to launch the first two Apple stores, and he and Ron Johnson you know, discuss it. And they say, oh, they're not organized exactly right. They're organized around product instead of what you would do with the product. So they hold it for three or four months until they get the store right. The iPad, he said something about it. He told Johnny, I just, it's just not right. And they realized it because it didn't feel like you could scoop it up with your left hand, that it was something you could just grab and go. So they curve it slightly. But that means re-engineering, you know, even where your slots are and how you plug in the, uh, you know... Uh, so I think by having that care for the product, you can imbue it in the DNA. He also said that the way companies, as I quote him at the end of saying this, lose that DNA is when they make great products, they get a natural monopoly sometimes for a little while. Maybe they have a Windows operating system or for that matter, you know, an iPod or iPhone. And he said, and when you have that natural monopoly, your tendency is that the next round of promotions go to the sales and marketing people because they're the ones who can drive the profit needle up as opposed 
to the engineers and product people. He said, once you find yourself doing that, you're in trouble. That's what's killing Microsoft. It'll never survive with Steve Ballmer there. He's the sales and marketing guy. You've got to have, in each and every way, show that you're creating a company in which the artists, the designers, and the product people feel they're the ones more rewarded. So, you know, the book, I hope, extracts many lessons about how you infuse a DNA into a company. Peter Cook, Jr., uh, in the business school. Two quick questions. Firstly, I would love if you could uh, just have any comments on Jonathan Ives, especially because I believe Steve has previously said that he's one of the few people at Apple who he considered as very close to be a true equal to him. And uh, secondly, I know the focus is on Steve Jobs right now, but looking forward, is there, off the top of the head, do you have any people you're interested in or who you really would want to focus on your next, next piece of work? Yeah. Um, Johnny Ive, uh, Steve's wife said to me, I quote, is the only indispensable person that Steve has ever worked with. And it was a pairing, the likes of which, you're too young to remember, but we used to have great industrial designers in this world. You know, the Dita Rams at Braun, is that what you just said? Yeah. yeah. I, and the Braun brothers, you know, they bonded with Dita Rams. You can't tell me you know, who Howard Stringer at Sony is bonding with these days. There is not in any great industries, even the auto industry, I don't think, have the grand designers that they had in the past. But Johnny Ive and Steve Jobs were design partnership really for the ages. And uh, I have, you know, very long chapter just on that particular relationship because I think it's a key you know, to understanding, which the, and I think I've been criticized actually, I don't do as much about, say, software engineering as I do about design, but for this conference at least, where it's a humanities and design connected to business, I think it's important. So, um, you know, they would spend every afternoon when Steve was in town, other than Wednesdays when he had his uh, communications meeting, he would spend it just sitting there and uh, not standing, uh, sitting, but walking around this beautiful design studio that Johnny Ive had on the second floor of, I mean, the first floor of the second building at Apple. And they just fondle things and say, just the two of them, this isn't quite right. I mean, one day I watched them do it because it's a very secretive room, but I was allowed in it. But they're just spending 20, 30 minutes playing with a foam model of the electrical plug that will work on the European version of the iPad. But that's why he has a design patent, Steve, on the electric plug, that wonderful white block you get with you. He has a design patent in his name and Johnny's on the box you open to see the iPad and the iPod cradled in it, the way the box opens, because it's got to be emotional, the way it opens. So that was the type of partnership they had. And I'm sorry, I'm now getting old and forgotten this part two was... If there's any person of interest... Person in of interest to me next. Uh, there are a lot of great people in Silicon Valley coming along. Uh, I mean, I think Zuckerberg, uh, Page, others have the same type of passion. Steve, uh, there were, I was working on... I'm from New Orleans, as uh, the president said, and I uh, was working on a book on Louis Armstrong because I believe in diversity and how that leads to creativity. And the wonderfully diverse neighborhood I grew up in was the same one that Louis Armstrong did, Central City in New Orleans. Uh, but I couldn't really crack the code on Louis Armstrong. I just couldn't figure out what was behind the smile. I knew everything about him except for who he was. So I'm working right now and going to Oxford, the Baudelaire, next week to start work on Ada Lovelace, Lord Byron's daughter, who was a, I mean, this is the same thing we're talking about today. Her father was obviously a pretty good poet. Her mother, as you may recall, Lady Byron was not all that fond of Lord Byron by the time Ada was growing up, so insisted that she become a mathematician. So she writes the first computer algorithms for Charles Babbage's difference and analytic engine. And so it's the beginning of that intersection of technology and art and poetry that you see. And I want to take her theme and use it as a theme to explain the digital revolution, but we'll see if that works. How you doing? Um, I'm Ebony, and I'm curious as to how this book um, actually took 
how you felt about writing this book. Um, not n knowing whether or not you're seeing his health deteriorate yeah. and everything. So just wondering the effect that it had on you and even yeah. on your writing and just saying, you know, I have to make sure I capture this. I have to make sure I gather this info. It was incredibly difficult and very emotional. Um, first of all, I'm not like Steve Jobs, meaning A, I'll never invent the iPad, but B, I really like people and I want them to like me and I'm kind of nice. So he's saying, <laughs> be brutally honest and he's dying or seems like he's very sick and I'm, he's telling me these stories and all and I know it's going to be a warts and all book. So I try to make it kinder actually. I mean, there are things I left out, uh, you know, that I just felt didn't quite give a pro could be misinterpreted and didn't give the proper sense because he was still alive. But I also, every time I thought of doing that, I'd think, all right, he told me to be honest. He wants an honest book. His reality distortion field was so great that even though, you know, he was pretty sick by the end of last summer, he had outrun the cancer over and over again with his molecular targeted therapy. And the last time I saw him, the visit I talked to you about earlier, I'm sitting on his bed, and at one point he looks at me, and he was very tired, but he then looked up, and he said, there'll be parts of this book I don't like. And it was more a question than a statement. I said, yeah, there will be. He said, don't worry, uh, I won't read it. I won't read it for a while. I like it, I don't want to get mad, so I won't read it for another year. Now, that was a reality distortion field, which I think even he felt prey to. But I know I left that last meeting I ever had with him, you know, and walked out to the back garden and left, thinking, oh, great, he's going to be alive to see this book. He just told me he's going to live another year. So that's how emotional it got in dealing with that. And this is why I'm looking at somebody like Ada Lovelace, who's a couple centuries ago, and I can... <laughs> Be a little distant. The last question, sir. Oh, last question. Great. Uh, my name is Jim Walsh. I'm one of your guests here from the University of Michigan. Uh, cool. The, the, the great University, University of Michigan. Bravo. There you go. Um, just ask me. I'll tell you. Um, I have a question about learning, and I'd like to ask about uh, Steve, and then I'd like, like to ask about you, and, and you've just touched on it a bit. Um, I know Steve better than I know myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> Who's doing the biography of you? That's the, that's the question. Uh, when, you, when you talked about the, the influences on his life, it was his experience in college, his experience in India, um, and then his uh, appreciation for his art. His parents, yeah. And his, and, and, sorry, his father with the fence uh, um, and, and uh, the art, which is, I guess, mm. part and parcel of Reed. Um, but you didn't talk about learning throughout the rest of his life, and, and there were these imprinting experiences. Can you talk some about how he learned from his own experience and, and the like going forward? Uh, and then I'm just curious, right. well, there's a two-part question, but since we're both the same age, why don't I hold the second one? <laughs> All right. Um, the point of any biography is it's a narrative, and therefore one damn thing leads to another. So it's a learning experience throughout the book. So the Steve Jobs, who is running Apple in 1997, has learned a hell of a lot having been ousted in 85. And so the book tries to do that. I mean, that's what the 600 pages are for, which is, what did you learn by being ousted in 85? And that end-to-end -end control and perfection, he, I mean, I'll give you one example. In the very first Mac team, you know, just the, the line he had on the sign he put on the wall was, don't compromise. And then real artists, don't compromise. And then eventually it was real artist ship meaning you've got to get the product out the door eventually. So those are the type of things. And I don't try to preach it, but I just try to see, uh, you know, as if you're reading, you know, Tom Jones or some novel that the building's Roman, you're reading about how each lesson leads to a slightly wiser person, or sometimes doesn't. I have a theory, which I won't go into, but it's probably detailed in the book more than anybody wants, since I've not seen anybody comment on it, which is that the experience at Next Computer was a really important learning experience because he indulged, since he didn't have a board of directors or anything, every one of his instincts to make an absolutely beautiful, perfect product, and it was a total market flop. And so when he comes back to Apple 
the second go around, he doesn't make those mistakes. So anyway, that's the, I mean, that's why biographies, that's why, you know, sort of the 10 rules of business management books are usually 100 pages and biographies are 600 pages because you have to show the learning each step of the way. And part two is learning for you, if, if I may. Um, stay with me. I'll assert that you're a very accomplished uh, business person as, as well, a leader. Um, and so I'm curious about your, your dual life, if you will, of the allure of uh, biographies and writing the biographies and how the, the quest and then the lessons learned from writing the biographies inform your work at Aspen and CNN and on the yeah. boards and everything else. Well, it does. I mean, certainly you write... All biography is autobiography, as Emerson said. My daughter, once point, she's with all the wisdom of a college student, pointed out to me, you know, that in Ben Franklin, I was writing about myself, sort of a yuppie, striving, publishing journalist type who wants to get into diplomacy and, you know, and networking and stuff. And likewise, I said, well, what was I doing with Einstein, you know, Betsy? And she said, well, you're writing about uh, your father, because my father's a nice, kindly Jewish engineer who is a deeply hum humane person but loves engineering. I said, okay, then what was I doing with Kissinger? And she said, oh, Dad, you were writing about your dark side. <laughs> so thanks. And then she said, so, all right, she asked me, because uh, she's a computer science major in college, and, but also loves literature and art. So. And uh, she said, well, what do you think the Steve Jobs is? I said, I don't know. A bratty, uh, <laughs> uh, techie geek who loves the humanities and doesn't listen to people. And <laughs> she said, oh, dear. <laughs> um, I, you know, I try to learn each other. I mean, certainly I learned a lot from Ben Franklin, which is why I wanted to go to the Aspen Institute. On this stage, I'll, I'll, I'll just end with a story, because one of the things I learned from Walker Percy in Louisiana, which is that two types of people come out of Louisiana, preachers and storytellers. And he said, for God's sake, be a storyteller. The world's got too many preachers. So one day on this stage, you know, we're doing Crossfire, and I'm in my office and happen to be in Washington. And it was a day that uh, Judge Moore uh, in Alabama had kept the Ten Commandments on the steps, and a federal judge was telling them to release it, and they were sending in troops. And, and, this is, and the people from Crossfire say, oh, great, we have a Crossfire. Who's in favor of the Ten Commandments? Who's against them? <laughs> like, oh, great, great. And then, um, just then, was doing Ben Franklin, when he and Adams and Jefferson are editing the second paragraph of the Declaration. And Jefferson's first draft, as you may know, has, uh, we hold these truths to be sacred. And Franklin crosses it out with his black prince. And we hold these truths to be self-evident because it, it was, you know, the dictates of reason as opposed to the dictates of religion. That was supposed to. But the sentence goes on and say, um, and they're endowed with certain inalienable rights. And John Adams writes, and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable So you see them balancing in half of one sentence the role of religion and using it to unite us rather than divide us. And there we were you know, watching politicians and even us in the media using religion to divide us. And so, you know, that's when I said, you know, at some point I'm going to get out of this business and I'd like to work at a place like the Aspen Institute, whose mission is to try to find the common values that can unite us through our seminars and what we do. And so I think as you write books, I hope I've become a little bit less rude and nasty writing about Steve's rudeness. I hope I've become, you know, more like Ben Franklin, I hope I understand the magic of science better because for Einstein, it was such a magical thing. Those are the type of things you try to learn from other people, and it's why I write biographies, not because I'm a good business person, but because I really do believe that all we are is an accumulation of the lessons that went before us and the one or two things we might put back into that flow of lessons that is history. Thank you all. Thank you. Great. Ended on time. <laughs> Let me just say, uh, Mr. Eisen, I do want to say uh, in closing that uh, although you may not have written a manual about leadership, like every rich and fascinating account of an extraordinary life, I think you've given us a lot to think about when it comes to the human reality of leadership. Thank you very much. And one more round of applause, please, for this extraordinary work. <laughs>